Good afternoon. How's everyone doing? Good. Well, I'm Senator David Carlucci from the great state of New York. And it's an honor and a privilege to be able to moderate this panel here today, uh, a very timely topic uh, coming off of the Supreme Court decision in May, allowing for states to legalize and regulate sports betting. So the National Conference of State Legislature has put together a really dynamic group of panelists here today, experts on the topic. And we have with us uh, California Assemblyman Adam Gray, uh, Jeff Morad from Morgan Lewis right here in California, Scott Rader from Mintz Levine in New York, and Brian Seeley, Major League Baseball from New York, and Stephen DeMassey from Scientific Games Corporation. Uh, so with that, we're going to turn it over to our panelists. They're each going to have about 10 minutes to talk about what they've been working on and how they see the future of sports betting uh, in the states. Uh, and then at the end, we're going to take questions and try to take as many questions as we can. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Stephen DeMassey from Scientific Games Corporation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator. And thank you to uh, the NCSL for the opportunity to uh, participate in today's panel. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, first, with respect to the, the PASPA case, I'd like to thank NCSL for filing an amicus brief through the uh, state and local center. Um, I have two topics uh, to, to address here with you today. Um, the first one being key questions for you guys to consider and recommended guiding principles um, also. So with respect to the questions, I think uh, keep these three issues in mind. Um, what is good for the state and what's good for the consumer? Um, what will impede illegal sports betting? And what is the appropriate role for all parties involved, state versus federal, public versus private? With respect to some of the uh, guiding principles, I think the first one is, is, is certainly one of the more important ones, empowering state regulation. Uh, more than 40 states and 260 jurisdictions have been effective gaming regulators to date. Uh, sports betting can be governed uh, by, these, by these existing regulators. Um, through these existing entities, uh, you can establish licensing and testing standards along with consumer protections. Um, consider a broad scope of gaming operators that can offer sports betting. It could be tribal or commercial casinos, racetracks, lotteries, OTBs. Allow for betting on any sport, including professional or collegiate sports. All forms of betting types, whether it's uh, pre-game or live or what we call in-play wagering. You may want to consider a uh, land-based retail network uh, in addition to a, dig a digital distribution network, mobile. Have reasonable licensing fees for operators, technology suppliers, and private, uh, and, excuse me, and providers of services along with a competitive tax rate of say 10 to 16, uh, 10, excuse me, six to 10%. For quicker implementation, consider independent testing labs to test and improve software and consider uh, reciprocity with other states. Uh, second, we'd recommend you know, placing customers first, the consumer first. Um, the NBA commissioner recently said he believes they're entitled to an integrity fee. From our perspective, the only people entitled to anything are consumers. High integrity fees and unreasonable tax rates will drive consumers to, illegal, to the illegal market with no consumer protections because legal operators won't be able to offer competitive odds. Integrity fees siphon revenue from the state that would otherwise fund public safety and responsible gaming programs for consumers. Consumers want conveniences such as uh, interstate mobile wagering, which will unlock the full revenue potential of the U.S. market and allow for in-play betting, a growing and popular product. Uh, third recommends uh, strengthening game integrity. We all share an interest in integrity. Uh, the Major League Baseball Commissioner recently said, you don't need a bunch of state regulators regulating their sport. They can do it better. I say, let the regulators do the regulating, not the regulated. An integrity fee of 1% of all uh, money wagered legally to amount to over 20% of total revenue. Money in the leagues would skim off the top, decreases the total amount of money taxable by the government. Money that goes directly to the leagues distorts the odds the legal bookmakers are able to provide and would encourage Americans to continue to book with the legal bookmakers. Look to models like Nevada or Europe, such as the European Sports Security Association, ESSA. Our industry supports a model where ESSA um, works with the leagues, operators, law enforcement, regulators, which can share information through MOUs and to empower the regulators and law enforcement to utilize actual intelligence and technologies to strengthen integrity. 
To date, no state has mandated an integrity fee. Um, in addition, from what I understand, the NFL, NCAA, and NHL are not seeking an integrity fee. And we've also encouraged contracts over statutes. The leagues want governments to require our industry to buy their data. The mandated integrity fee could lead to a monopoly and extremely high pricing costs. These negotiations should be between two private commercial entities not codified into the statute. Uh, much of this information is public. The federal courts have already ruled that sporting event statistics are not subject to copyright and, can be, and cannot be exclusively owned by an event organizer. Today, no state has mandated the industry uh, buy its data from the leagues. And lastly, I think it's important to promote um, uh, advertising standards and responsible gaming practices uh, for this, this new channel, which will certainly include a different demographic of, of player. So in conclusion, the industry stands ready to, as a partner and a resource to the states. Um, we think this is about sovereignty. Uh, states are mobilizing some aren't. That's OK. Um, it could take some years for all the other states, uh, if they choose to, to, to implement sports betting. Um, but it's important to let them proceed in a way that makes sense for them and not let the federal government dictate state policy or business terms. And lastly, as a reminder, look to models that work already, like Nevada or the UK or other states that have recently legalized, like New Jersey. So with that, thank you. Next, we'll hear from Scott Rader. Hi, my name is Scott Rader. I'm from the law firm of... That's next door. Hi, my name is Scott Rader. I'm from the law firm of Mintz Levin. We have offices on both coasts. And while we, we counsel individuals and businesses who are involved in all parts of the gambling ecosystem, and we litigate cases involving gambling-related issues. And a big frustration that we've seen with our clients has been how nebulous the gambling regime has been and how nebulous gambling laws have been. And as states push to legalize and uh, adapt laws enabling gambling to proceed, I think there are some clear guidelines that can be drawn from the existing federal gambling landscape and lessons to be learned from how rules and regulations should be implemented that states can take a lot of value from. And by way of analogy, in the federal gambling landscape, the Wire Act has been the tool that federal law enforcement agencies have used most frequently, let's say, to prosecute gambling-related crimes. And what the Wire Act does is that it says if you're in the business of betting or wagering and you use interstate or fire, for, foreign wires to transfer bets or information assisting in the placement of bets, then you, you could be, you know, you're in violation of the Wire Act. There's a safe harbor for states if you're passing information, passing information from states or from a foreign county where the betting is legal to a state or the foreign county where the betting is legal. But putting the safe harbor aside, the language of the federal law is very broad. And that's had implications for people in the gambling ecosystem in two ways. One is that courts have said, although some courts have said this only applies to bookmakers, there's many people who are in the best business of betting or wagering, and many more people who will be in the business of betting or wagering. And to the extent that states are looking to federal gambling laws as some type of model for how to proceed, I think it's important to have you know an understanding of who the the regime is going to apply to. And the second issue that states could have is that to the extent that you're, the goal is to convert people from betting illegally to betting legally, you're going to want to have as many people as possible incentivized to know what, that whatever activity they're doing is actually lawful, which is going to involve, A, making sure that you can have just as good odds as the illegal bookmaking, and also as far as comfort so that people, when they're sitting on their couches and figuring out who to bet on, they can do it you know, in a mobile way, they could do in-play gaming in a way that doesn't subject them to not only state prosecution, but also potential federal prosecution. And if that's done, then I think people will be more and more likely, you know, to, to do this conversion that states are hoping to get. So to take the example, let's say two states both legalize gambling and they want people to be able to sit on their couch and bet in either their state or bet in their neighboring state. Well, a professional better, let's say, or a gambling operator if bets are being placed back and forth between those two states, they might still have issues with the federal gambling laws, even if they're in compliance with the state laws. And so I just think that state you know, legislatures and people involved within the states need to be thinking about the federal overlay to think about how whatever they're doing is going to intersect 
Same thing with data providers, with payment processors. There's a lot of folks who use wire transfers who are in the gambling ecosystem. And the fact that there still are these federal gambling regulations, I think, is an important thing to keep in mind. And states need to design a way that's going to ultimately help individuals and businesses who are trying to develop in the new business model to be you know, as lawful as possible within the state and the federal framework. So I think we'll try to keep our presentations brief so we have more time for questions. Great. Thanks, Scott. Next represent, uh, I'm in the State Assembly in California, represent Central California, Merced County, and Stanislaus County, predominantly uh, an agricultural community. But I serve as the chairman for the uh, Assembly Committee on Governmental Organization and have dealt with gaming issues for the past four years, uh, the entire six years that I've been in the Assembly, but the past four years as chairman of that committee. And I have, uh, during that tenure, certainly held the belief that regulated uh, gaming markets are better for uh, the consumer, uh, certainly better for the state, and have had several pieces of legislation. Currently, I have a uh, constitutional amendment uh, in the legislature to authorize sports wagering in California, given the recent Supreme Court decision on PASPA. Little history on gaming in California. We've got, uh, obviously, the largest market uh, in, the, in the country, uh, but we also have one of the most diverse gaming markets in the country. Uh, we have a significant uh, tribal government uh, casino uh, market. We have a significant uh, dozens of uh, tribal casinos actually throughout the state, nearly 100 card clubs and poker rooms. Uh, we have a uh, robust horse racing industry, some of the premier horse racing uh, in the country. Uh, and of course, we have a state lottery. So uh, gaming policy is not simple uh, in California, and certainly uh, it is an effort uh, undertaken largely by the voters. In 1933, horse racing was authorized by the voters in California uh, via initiative. In 1984, we had the state lottery. Uh, then in the late 90s, early 2000s, we had tribal gaming. Uh, and currently, those uh, are negotiated via compact by the governor. This is the reason we have a constitutional amendment before us. Uh, in California, uh, because there's this uh, established history of uh, letting the voters decide uh, if we have sports wagering in California, it will be decided on the ballot, most likely, uh, well, at the nearest opportunity in 2020. Uh, we are past that opportunity here in 2018, given the timing of the decision and the work that's going to have to go into uh, balancing and working with all of our different current operators in the state. Some of the factors we're looking at that are going to uh, certainly influence things, tax rates, obviously, and we've looked at what some of the other states, and I think that's one of the great benefits we're going to have being the largest market is some of the other states are moving ahead of us in uh, establishing gaming. They have uh, less entities and less uh, industry that they're working with in those states, and uh, we're going to watch and see how successful and what the appropriate uh, tax rate numbers look like. Um, certainly, you know, who's uh, providing uh, media da data, what relationships exist with the leagues, um, and then, of course, the issue of online betting, I think, is going to be uh, a major issue, certainly from a consumer perspective. I think there's probably or arguably great demand uh, for an online product. We've had reservations in California about engaging in uh, online gaming. The only current online gaming uh, that we offer uh, is, in fact, horse racing uh, over uh, networks. We've got... Uh, exclusivity uh, given to our uh, tribal governments uh, and the casinos that they operate. Uh, we have expressly prohibited both at our state lottery uh, initiative and then later the operation of Nevada style casinos in California. This is another issue that further complicates uh, sports wagering in California and another reason uh, if we move forward with it the voters would certainly have to uh, be part of that discussion. I look forward to uh, engaging uh, with our colleagues from around the country, and uh, certainly we plan to take uh, our committee members and visit several of the states throughout the country who are pursuing uh, and have pursued uh, or signed into law uh, sports wagering uh, legislation. 
uh, get educated on the issue and certainly hopefully learn from the lessons of the other states as we move towards that uh, potential November 2020 opportunity uh, to put something before the voters in California uh, and ultimately have a sports wagering market uh, in California. And I'll look forward to uh, the questions and comments and uh, move on to the next speaker. Thank you, Assemblyman Gray. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Jeff Morad of Morgan Lewis. Thank you, Senator. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm Jeff Morad, and I uh, am here uh, uh, with a law firm card in my pocket today. But uh, truth be told, uh, I'm a sports guy. Uh, spent my career in sports, um, and most recently uh, was a, an owner and uh, the CEO of the Arizona Diamondbacks, uh, as well as the San Diego Padres. Um, so when I was asked to uh, come today, uh, it wasn't to uh, add another lawyer necessarily to the panel, but uh, at least it was explained that, uh, that my sports industry experience was something that uh, might be helpful and interesting to discuss. Uh, and, you know, the gaming uh, side of the business is actually one that uh, has played a, a prominent role in my own history uh, in the sports business. When I first went to Arizona uh, in 2004 to run the Diamondbacks, uh, I'll never forget uh, one of the early projects we had was an opportunity for sponsorship with Gila River, which is an Indian community, a Native American community in Arizona that uh, was quite prominent and had a significant sponsorship deal that they were interested in pursuing with the club. Uh, Major League Baseball at the time had a rule that no team could do an agreement with anyone that owned a sports book. And in fact, uh, Gila River did uh, through the casinos that they operated. And so it took uh, a considerable amount of time and effort to kind of work through what turned into the first Major League Baseball team agreement uh, with a casino. Um, when I, by the time I got to San Diego in 2009, uh, it was uh, commonplace and certainly uh, the Padres, uh, for any of you who live in San Diego, know that uh, that, that they enjoy a number of relationships uh, with local Native American communities and, and it's a significant part of the revenue picture, frankly, of teams uh, today. So that, um, you know, how this new frontier will impact uh, teams uh, certainly is yet to be seen. Um, I probably am a bit more conservative than Mark Cuban, who announced that, you know, on the eve of the, uh, or excuse me, on the, uh, as following up the uh, Supreme Court ruling that, that every uh, uh, owner in the top four sports leagues in the U.S. just uh, doubled their franchise value as a result of the Supreme Court uh, decision. I don't think that uh, I'd be quite that bullish, but I would certainly suggest that uh, that the legalization of what's been certainly commonplace underground uh, for many, many years and for certainly all of our lives um, is, a, is a good thing. Uh, it's a good thing for, I think, the sports industry. Ultimately, the derivative benefits flow to the individual franchise owners in sports. Uh, in the different leagues, and it's a good thing for the states. Um, not only does it uh, create a revenue opportunity uh, as a franchise owner, or at least a former one, I would hope for the most organized, um, you know, kind of widespread effort in terms of regulating the business um, and the and this part of the industry. Uh, you know, simpler is better, at least in the world that uh, I come from. And uh, I would hope that the leagues are active uh, with all the individual states. And, you know, at least from my perspective, I would hope that there might be an opportunity for even a federal approach that would, uh, you know, create state revenue rightfully, but also uh, uh, create a, a fairly simple approach as it relates to regulation. Uh, but I do believe that revenue opportunities will flow uh, more easily uh, from the legalization of, of sports betting. Uh, we only need to look to the Premier League uh, in 
the UK is a great example of how, uh, you know, whether it's Betfair or any number of companies who are active uh, in that marketplace, uh, they represent a significant uh, influence on the revenue side of that particular sport, um, you know, Premier League soccer, uh, football as they call it. And, uh, and I think that it certainly has the potential to become uh, significant in the U.S. as well. So it's my hope that all of you, uh, uh, whether you're, uh, as principals or as influencers, uh, are able to, uh, to navigate uh, a, a form of regulation that makes sense for teams, uh, because I think at the end of the day, we all win as a result of this ruling. So thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And our next panelist from Major League Baseball, Brian Seeley. Good afternoon, everybody. I am the nerd with the PowerPoint today, so right. please, please indulge me. Well, that's pretty good. My name is Brian Seeley. I'm a senior vice president and deputy general counsel at Major League Baseball. My job really focuses on protecting baseball from threats to the integrity of the game whether that come from cheating through use of performance enhancing drugs, whether that come from off the field misconduct, or whether it comes from sports betting. Before joining Major League Baseball, I was a prosecutor in Washington, D.C. for eight years, and I came to MLB four years ago. We've uh, talked quite a bit already in the panel about the monetary aspects of sports betting and, and those aspects have really dominated the conversations about sports betting in the past year. Um, I think when a lot of people talk about sports betting, they see dollar signs. And I'm going to talk about some of the monetary aspects of sports betting today. But before I do that, I want to talk about something that I think has gotten a little lost in the conversation around sports betting in the last year, and that is sports what sports means to us as Americans, um, and what is really at stake in this conversation about how we implement regulations and laws for sports betting. If you grew up in this city and you're a sports fan, I don't have to explain to you uh, this photograph. You recognize it. It's an iconic moment where Kirk Gibson hit a home run in the 1998, excuse me, 1988 World Series in game one to win the game. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Not iconic if you're an uh, A's fan. Uh, but the, re the reason it's iconic is really that it represents values that we hold dear. Playing through pain, overcoming adversity, grace under pressure. That's what made this moment iconic. If you are a Cubs fan in Illinois or Iowa or anywhere else in this country, I don't need to tell you what this photograph is. Cubs fans waited 108 years to win that World Series in 2016, and it's something they'll never forget. And even two weeks ago, DC had an iconic moment when Bryce Harper won the home run derby uh, in his home stadium, uh, coming back uh, from a huge lead um, and, and winning it, and making that stadium as loud as I had ever seen it before. The fact is that sports brings the people in your cities and states together. It becomes part of their shared history and it becomes part of the identity of the places that you all come from. But sports is not just, and baseball is not just a part of our culture, it's also an important part of the economy. We are a major source of employment in every state in which we operate. Our teams at the major and minor league level pay millions of dollars in state and local taxes. And we're an economic engine for hundreds of small and not so small businesses. If you ever walk around the South Bronx before a Yankees game, you'll see the economic impact that that club has on that area. And it's the same in San Diego, Chicago, Boston, and many other cities. A report released this week estimated that the economic impact for the state of Florida for spring training just this year was over $680 million. And it's not just game day activities. Our uniforms are manufactured in a factory in Pennsylvania. New Era, based in Buffalo, New York, is the provider of our baseball caps. We're an engine for the economy. And it's not just the economy. We get back to the community. Those of you who saw our All-Star game uh, would not be able to forget this moment from prior to the All-Star game, we honored 29 Medal of Honor recipients in a really moving ceremony. 
In the last 10 years, we've given over $40 million to stand up to cancer for cancer research. And our clubs, our players, our mascots make countless appearances at youth events all over the country. We have a long relationship with the boys and girls clubs. We have eight youth academies that benefit disadvantaged children throughout this country. So why am I sitting up here and telling you how great baseball is? I'm telling you how great baseball is or how great I think it is because I really want you, I need you to understand what's at stake in this debate and that there are two sides to this debate. And that sports betting can be good for baseball, it can be good for your states, it can be good for bookmakers, or it can be really bad for everyone. And sports betting puts all of what I just talked about at risk. The reason the commissioner's office exists, my current employer, is because of a betting scandal, the 1919 Black Sox. In more recent times, uh, we've had other scandals, including the Pete Rose scandal which continues to get brought up every year around this time of year when the Hall of Fame induction ceremony takes place, which took place last weekend. We understand, though, that legal sports betting is here to stay. I'm not here today to tell you stop sports betting. We understand it's available already in three states. Delaware and New Jersey uh, started offering it in the last few months, in addition to Nevada. Bills were in play in, in 2018 in 18 states. We expect that to double next year. And so long as sports betting is done right, it's not necessarily a bad thing for us. In-play betting is going to give our fans a new way to engage with our games. There, there's the potential for increased viewership and sponsorships, as Jeff just mentioned. And hopefully, if it's done right, it's going to bring transparency to what's currently a black market. But we need your help to protect our national pastime. We want to be viewed as partners, not adversaries in this process. We are a major stakeholder in this process. There is no sports betting without sports. And so as part of that, we have developed a five-point plan for sports betting legislation. It's something I've been talking about in a number of the states uh, that you all are in for the past six months. And to do this, we looked uh, to Europe and Australia for precedent. And we're trying to strike a balance between eliminating the black market, generating tax revenue for your states, protecting the integrity of our game, and aligning the incentives of the stakeholders. And there were bills introduced in a number of states, including New York, Connecticut, Illinois, Kansas, Missouri, and Indiana, that hit most of our key points. And so I want to go through those points. And the first point that I think is important that we think should be in legislation is an opt-out right, where we have some input into what kinds of bets bookmakers can offer. We're not looking to restrict betting on the outcome of our Major League Baseball games. But we have real integrity risks for our minor league games. Some of you are from states with no major league clubs, but you likely have at least one minor league club in your state. Right now, there is not a robust betting market on minor league baseball. And we would like to keep it that way. We don't want casinos to create one. And so we want to have a voice in that conversation and talk to you all, talk to the regulators about what is fair to offer bets on and what is not. Point number two is the integrity provisions. And frankly, these are the ones that are near and dear to my heart as the person focused on protecting the integrity of baseball. And I want to address a point uh, that was made earlier about, well, the existing state regulators can handle this. In New Jersey, which is currently offering sports betting, they are accepting bets on all of our baseball games. How many of those games are being played in New Jersey? How many of those games does the New Jersey regulator have authority over? I'll tell you the answer to that question. It's zero. Because every single one of our games takes place outside of the state. And so people who in the gaming industry who say, sports betting is just like any other games, will regulate it just like that. This isn't a blackjack table in your casino in your state. This is not a craps table. This is not a slot machine. This involves people. You are betting on the actions of people in different states. And that requires a really robust regulatory structure that exists in some European countries, but does not exist in Nevada. Nevada regulates sports plating like it regulates craps. That makes no sense in 2018, and that's not what your state should do. Operators should be required to share data, anonymized data, so that it can be aggregated with casinos in your states and in other states so that we can spot suspicious betting activity and eliminate integrity problems before they occur. We should be prohibiting insiders from betting on baseball at the state level. 
And we should require casinos to let the leagues know if they know of an integrity problem. If they have information about game fixing, they should be required to let us know. And they should be, they, they should be required to cooperate with our investigations. Because in the absence of the New Jersey regulators' ability to go to New York or Seattle or Florida or any of the other places that we're talking about to interview our players or to look into suspicious betting there, it's going to fall to the leagues to regulate sports betting. And we want to regulate sports betting. We need to. All we have is the integrity of our games. Without it, our games don't survive. But we need help and we need cooperation and we need to be a partner. A third point is official league data. We think that there should be one source of truth for sports betting. And so consumers in states uh, shouldn't have to have their bets settled by unofficial data operators who are either scraping data illegally from websites or even worse, potentially, are actually entering into our stadiums and surreptitiously starting data businesses and sending data, which is what goes on in Europe and some other places. We're in favor of mobile betting. People can bet on their phones right now. People in this city are betting on Bovada today on sports. And so in order to help eliminate the legal market, we do think there needs to be a legal uh, mobile option for sports betting. And finally, the royalty fee. Now this is the point that has garnered the most attention by far in the debate on sports betting over the past six months, and I understand why. So let me um, dispel some myths about it and tell you exactly what we're asking for and why we think it's important. So we're asking for 0.25% of the amount wagered on Major League Baseball games or events. So for $100 bet on a Major League Baseball game, we're asking that the casinos pay us a quarter, 25 cents, 25 cents of $100. The fee would pay from the, the, the quarter would come from the operators, not the state and not the customers. We're not looking to take away from state tax revenue. We're not looking to take away money from classrooms. That's a great casino talking point. But the fact is, you should put a tax rate however high you want on sports betting in your state. That's up to you. What you want to generate the revenue from, you should do. But we think the operator should have to pay us a very small percentage of the amount of money they're making on our games. And assuming a hold rate of 6.5%, which I think is low, the casinos are going to tell you it's 5%, but we've actually seen um, hold rates much higher than that already in New Jersey and Delaware. That amounts, what we're asking for, less than 4% of the billions of dollars of revenue states are going to be opening up for casinos to make um, on Major League Baseball games. Uh, it's always dicey to put up numbers that are clearly estimates. Um, nobody knows what this, uh, I think, market is going to look like, but based on the American Gaming Association study, um, from last year, they estimated sports betting revenue in a mature market. Um, this is in the millions. This is assuming, again, a hold rate of 6.5% and a state tax rate of 12%, which is the tax rate in Mississippi. Some states are higher. New Jersey's 13% on mobile betting. Um, Pennsylvania's in the 30% range. Some states are lower. But assuming around 12%, you can see the amount of money that's going to be made annually by the operators, $15 billion. State, state revenue, tax revenue, around $2 billion, and you'll see that the share that we're asking for, Major League Baseball and the other leagues, is a very small fraction. The idea that this is not affordable to the operators is a myth. So why should we get the fee? Well, we're going to have increased costs in a world of increased sports betting, and this will be a world of increased sports betting. Not only will it be a world of increased sports betting, but the exposure of our athletes, our umpires, our official scores, our clubhouse attendance to sports betting is going to increase significantly. And with increased exposure comes increased risk to us. And so while the casinos bear the profit of unlocking sports betting, we bear the risk. And it's also a recognition, this fee, that there is no sports betting without sports, that we are the primary input into betting on Major League Baseball games. Now, the fee pays for itself if we're able to drive up handle a little less than 5%. And what do I mean by that? Why is the fee good for states? Well, look, we at baseball have an interest in driving wagering to states that have robust integrity protections, that require official data, and that give us, allow us to get a small percentage from operators of the wagering on our games. And so that's what we will do. 
we don't want to drive money to markets like New Jersey that are as untransparent to us now as the Bovada market is, as the international offshore market is. And we have the incentive and the ability to drive handle for betting on our games to states that have strong protections and this kind of legal framework. We're also going to look to, for other ways to help boost the local economy, and we really want to be a partner with the states in this endeavor. So I'll end with a, a last piece of news of something that broke today, um, which is that the MGM Casino and uh, or MGM Resorts and the NBA reached a deal um, that was announced today, a partnership deal. And I don't know the parameters of the deal. I work for baseball, not the NBA. But my understanding is that it includes, um, you know, a number of the provisions, a number of the ideas that we're looking for in legislation. And so it begs the question, I would think, well, why do you need legislation if you can reach commercial agreements with casinos? I'll tell you right now, we're not going to be able to reach commercial agreements with all the bookmakers. And states should want to have strong integrity protections and drive handle to their states. And the way to ensure that is to have minimum standards in the law. And that's what we're asking for, minimum standards in the law. I think commercial agreements are an important way to protect the league's interests, but they're not going to go all the way in protecting the league's and state's interests. And that's why we think legislation is really important. So thank you for indulging the PowerPoint. I appreciate it. Great, thank you, Brian. We have time for some questions, so let's uh, line up behind these uh, two gentlemen and uh, please state your name and the question you have. We'll try yes, to get in as many as we can, please. Okay, thank you. I'm Senator Bill Coley from Ohio. I chair the committee that handles these issues in Ohio, and I'm also blessed to, to be the president of the National Council of Legislators from Gaming States. So we, we've addressed a number of these issues, and, and uh, while we may disagree on uh, the payment of a, a uh, integrity fee or whatever Major League Baseball wants to call the fee to the leagues, I, I do agree with, to, with the point that the league should not bear the expense of maintaining, and, there, and your points of the need for legislation are many and accurate, and, and I agree with many of those. But whatever your state wants to do, I think the need to, to legislate is going to become uh, important, whether you want to try to in, create a real ban on sports betting, and enforce that, that's one thing, or if you want to legal, if you want to fight illegal betting by, you know, legalizing and, and creating that, uh, you guys have talked about, you guys have talked about, uh, you know, tax rates and things like that, very important, 70, 70 percent of all wagers in uh, soccer are in play bets, not, not just the outcome of the game, but who's going to score the next goal, is there going to be a yellow card? whatever going on, I think, uh, I think most people anticipate that in professional or in sports betting in the states as we legalize it here. But one of the, the issues that we see, and I, I wanted to get the reaction of the panel to, and we've talked about it, is each state mandating, if they are going to allow sports betting, mandating a portal that monitors all wagers. And the portal then checks for anti-money laundering, problem gaming, match integrity, consumer protections, tax collection, league negotiations in dealing with that. And that becomes a, a burden of the state to operate the portal and take care of those issues. And then you make the decisions in your state whether who you're going to allow to offer books in the state, whether you're going to, we talked about, you know, two distinct products, the traditional sports book and the lottery kind of entertainment sports bet. Um, but, but using technology today, stuff that didn't exist, they can't, you know, we talked to, uh, Chairwoman Harris in Nevada, she can't go in, you know, retroactively and mandate that all the spet, sports bet go through a portal to monitor everything. But uh, as we, each state enacts this around the country, what do uh, you, what do the panelists think about monitoring each one and making sure that we have a good grasp on what's going on and uh, making sure that we're fighting all the bad things that could happen and are currently happening in the illegal sports market. Any panelists? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll address that first. Um, you know, I think a model will, will certainly evolve where you'll have the state regulators working with the operators, suppliers, bookmakers, all the actors, the leagues, to figure out a way how to, how to manage this, um, as they've done in other jurisdictions, uh, for, for sure. And you know, we've got very experienced gaming regulators in all our states, whether it's, it's gaming and or lottery, you've got tribes, et cetera. Um, 
and using technology and MOUs and, and information sharing and everything else that's going to uh, come to fruition. Um, and the fact that the legal sports betting market will help, you know, uh, uh, determine if there is a legal, uh, uh, any illegal activity, uh, game fixing going on. It will bring everything to light and it will be uh, visible um, and out of the, uh, the, the, the black market. So I think we'll get there. I, I know there's a lot of conversations going on at, like at Nickel G's and, and, and through other um, associations, et cetera, that are looking to address this. But I've got a lot of faith in our regulators that they'll figure this out. Uh, at the end of the day, bring everybody together, and you know, I, I'm, I'm confident we, we will get there. There's models out there to look at, like in Europe with the ESSA. I think it's important to look at. Uh, it's interesting. It was said in some of the earlier comments on the panel here that there's two sides to the debate, and I. It, uh, today, at least estimated, um, and there's tons of illegal activity associated with that kind of black market activity. Uh, we do have some examples in multiple states of uh, regulatory structures that work pretty well when it comes to gaming activities, but I think we have to first and foremost keep kind of public safety at the forefront of the discussion uh, on sports wagering. And I think the second point is consumer protections. I mean, th there's significant uh, gambling addiction issues out there. We've got to make sure that uh, state uh, programs throughout the country are funded to uh, mitigate those issues and make sure that consumers are, are protected both in their uh, both financially, uh, but also uh, with the dangerous kind of underbelly uh, of gaming activities. And then I think third, uh, it's important to keep in mind that we protect current industries that provide, uh, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars in many uh, jobs uh, throughout the country. And that ranges anywhere from our professional sports teams, which are huge drivers in the economy, uh, to our casinos and card clubs and horse racing industry and all of the uh, horse uh, breeders that support horse racing and on and on and on. So I think we don't want to take action certainly that erodes current uh, uh, positive uh, economic factors. And uh, I think if we kind of go in that order as we approach uh, a framework, uh, certainly learn from the lessons that regulators uh, have learned in, in the few states where this has gone on. Uh, we're going to be better off as uh, all states and as a country. Yeah, I'd just add uh, just a couple brief uh, remarks. Uh, you know, look, there are winners and losers in this, and you know clearly the the illegal uh, bookies are the losers, and that's a good thing. I think I think we could all agree on that. Um, but the uh, but the winners are are you know numerous, and you know they begin with. You know, the sports industry itself, the ability to, you know, from a team standpoint uh, or league standpoint, the ability to monetize uh, some of that activity for the first time, uh, other than having sold sponsorship deals or, or done sponsor deals uh, with, with casinos in the past, to be able to monetize this industry is a huge upside. And I assume that most of you in the room who, uh, are either elected officials or work for for them, um, you know, see it similarly as an opportunity to monetize. So, you know, look, it's a, I think it's a good thing, net net, and uh, and I just uh, you know, look, I'll sit on the sidelines uh, uh, and uh, and root for all of you to uh, create, as I suggested earlier, the simplest, most manageable system that you can uh, for all concerned. Yeah, just on the question of the portal, um, I, I do think there needs to be aggregation of betting data, um, not just at the state level, but at, at the national level. And so, look, we're, we're inclined to do that. We, we have the motivation to do it, but it doesn't have to be us. If there were a federal regulator, um, you know, it could be the federal government. But I do think you make the point Nevada's not doing it. And, and this is my point about how Nevada regulation is not the model for this. You all don't have to follow Nevada. You can look to European betting markets that have had 20 years to evolve. We don't need to evolve in this country. We've seen what works and what doesn't. Um, and having a portal where all the data comes in and can be monitored is hugely important. I totally agree. Great. Looks like we have a question from Assemblyman Walter Mosley. <laughs> Thanks, Senator. Um, twofold. Um, we held up our vote uh, on, uh, on gaming 
uh, in the State Assembly for other reasons. But the two um, questions I have, one, uh, as, the, as the associations lobbied us, uh, particularly the players' associations, uh, their issue was, at that time, it's going to take revenue from players. Now, just recently, I read an article now that the players' associations are scared because of all the added exposure through social media that players, their livelihood, their self, their, their safety, their reputations will be exposed in light of us legalizing uh, gaming uh, nationally. Um, that's one question. I just want to get your take on that. And then two, as it relates to um, intercollegiate athletics, where you're more prone to have uh, athletes uh, to be taking bets, to shaving points. Um, how do we, or how would you suggest we as states that have so many universities that participated in scholastic athletics deal with that particular issue going forward? Because I believe that's where we're going to have uh, a significant problem. And if the NCAA is not going to be involved, how do you guys as professional sports, uh, we'll deal with that. I know Mr. Selig talked about minor league baseball, but these are athletic, these are these are sports that are separate and apart from the many of the professional sports that we're talking about. Um, I, I'll say that with respect to the players union, absolutely they're a key actor in this debate. Um, as a member of the American Gaming Association and being involved in this, the sports betting task force for a number of years, I know uh, Sarah uh, Sloan. As, uh, who works at the AJA has been engaging with the players' union. So I know there's a lot of dialogue going on with all the actors that are impacted um, by this. So, um, and then with respect to um, NCAA, I know that you know th there's been a lot. Of, there's been some engagement with them. I know that individual universities and colleges are are interacting with their their state legislators and governor's office, and the, and the conferences are. Um, but at the end of the day, um, but they're not. I have not yet spoken no. to any university or college yeah. president. Vice President, or Athletic Director, and State of well, I, Okay, uh, um, I just I've heard stories that there has been some engagement out there, but in, it's kind of defaulting, you know, down to that more of that state level. Maybe not in every state with every legislator, but um, I think though, you know, having a legal market, having it regulated and taxed, you know, it's happening already, right? There's a lot of sports wagering happening, obviously, in the NCAA football uh, and basketball, March Madness, etc. So being able to legalize it and have that scrutiny, integrity, you know. Uh, on that model and bring people from the black market into the legal market, there's going to be more transparency in betting and be able to identify where there is game fixing by this aggregate with game, uh, with the sharing of data and information at the, at the end of the day. And people can identify the fact that why is all this betting all of a sudden going on the underdog or, or whatever it may be. So I think the process of, of legalizing it will certainly help bring more transparency and, and, and enforcement to, uh, to the game. Uh, and I, you know, I spent 20 years uh, before moving into ownership on the player side of the business. Um, my partner uh, Lee Steinberg and I had the largest football practice in the country for 18 years uh, that we were together, and I actually had the second largest baseball practice in the country for about 15 years. So I certainly am sensitive and uh, and experienced on the uh, sensitive to the players' concerns and and experienced on that side of the aisle as well. Um, I, I would say that, uh, you know, look, the players associations are, are in essence partnered with the leagues in each of the sports. And the truth is they have every right to be concerned about the integrity aspect of this issue and should be. And, and I would assume that, you know, all of you will listen to those concerns because they're critical. And they're the ones that, as we say, they wear it. Um, you know, the team owners will theoretically um, you know, derive benefit from some of the monetization issues. But the fact is, the players are going to have to live with it and live with, you know, worst case finger pointing questions, issues. You mentioned social media. Certainly, that makes everyone accessible these days. Um, so I understand that that's a legitimate concern. I would just advise or, or suggest to all of you that you know you keep your ear to the ground on the PA side as well. Um, I don't think they're going to be as focused on 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 the precise uh, you know mechanisms or structures 
uh, as the leagues will be and as the teams will be. But I do think, as you suggest, they have some integrity concerns to make sure that they're protected. And, you know, it's a league responsibility in the individual sports, and it's obviously yours as it relates to the regulatory side. Yeah, and I would just add on, you know, I do think NCAA athletes are certainly on, on the more vulnerable side of things. Um, but the integrity protections that we think should be in the law, I, I think, help all leagues. They help the NCAA, they help Major League Baseball. And with those things in place, um, you know, I'm confident that, that sports betting um, um, could be managed in a way that, that it won't do damage to, to college athletics. Um, but if it's not done, if you have laws like New Jersey and West Virginia without really any integrity provisions, you, you may see problems. Great. Looks like our, our next question, all the way from Canada, Member of Parliament, Brian Massey. Thank you. Um, thank you for the panel for being here. My question to be to Mr. Seeley, um, Major League Baseball has been opposed to two bills in Canada, one that I sponsored recently, um, actively lobbying against it. Would the terms and conditions of your change of position over here apply to Canada now as well? Um, that's important because I think that the consistency um, is going to be very important. Um, and uh, second to that, uh, what can we do to follow through on that? Because uh, things have really changed since this has been a 15-year struggle. Joe Comartin had the first bill that was defeated in the Senate, Major League Baseball, um, presented in the Senate to kill that bill. And then um, most recently, two years ago, was opposed to my legislation, which is elimination of one line in the criminal code to do the things that are necessary to bring in regulatory practices similar to Europe. Um, would that be the kind of the same model that you presented here for us? Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, my focus has been on the U.S., so I can't speak a lot to the specifics in Canada or what we've done there in the past. But um, you know, I think we are uh, we're happy to relook at our position, and I'm happy to come up to Canada and and come up to Ottawa, hopefully before the winter. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, look, I think that um, you know we've come to the conclusion that if if done correctly, sports betting can work in this country. So I I would think that would apply to Canada too, but. I need to get clearance from the Blue Jays before I commit to that. Yes. Fair enough, and thank you. I'll give him my card after. Great. Any other questions? Great. We just want to thank the panelists. Thank you so much for this uh, informative discussion. Appreciate it.